A few years back, my husband was experiencing some numbness in his lower leg. He tried to get into the doctor who was booked and went to see the PA. She had trouble picking up a pulse in his ankle. So she sent him to a cardiologist who deals with issues like this. He did an angiogram to determine what was going on with the blood flow down to Gary's foot. And of course, he found blockage. Despite the fact that Gary had no risk factors for this, he needed a bypass in his leg. The disease is called peripheral artery disease, but the bypass restored the blood to his foot. The symptom led to the diagnosis, which led to the cure. In a very similar way, we're going to see Jesus in, in our passage today talk about a heart problem, a heart problem that deals with money and possessions. I call it materialistic heart disease. And he's going to point out some symptoms and he's going to talk about the cure for this disease. Let's pray. Father, we just give you this time together. I just pray that you would speak through your word to each and every one of us. In a materialistic culture, these were hard lessons, and sometimes we're just not sure how to follow through with them. So I pray, Father, that you would speak and you would give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We've seen so far in the Sermon on the Mount that the theme is about the kingdom life or the ethic of the kingdom. And it begins with qualities of God's people that we call the Beatitudes. Then down in 520, as Kristen talked about several weeks ago, Jesus mentions that God's kingdom people will have greater righteousness than the greatest religious leaders of his day. And it's followed by example after example of people who are doing things with motives that have nothing to do with God, but they are often following the rules of the game, of the religious game. As in the past, and as we go past that, we get to our passage today where he continues the idea of a greater righteousness, and this time in regard to money and possessions. So as we go through the verses, we're gonna see three symptoms of materialistic heart disease, and we're going to see the cure. So we're gonna begin reading in Matthew 6, and we're just gonna read right now verses 19 to 24. Do not accumulate for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and devouring insect destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But accumulate for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and devouring insect do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As Jesus says this, he has just described these other people whose hearts did not align with their actions. And so here he turns to money and possessions and he summarizes the problem with both in this way. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our treasures indicate what we love. Do we love the things of the world? Are we, are we motivated by ourselves or by love of God? So the first symptom of materialistic heart disease is piling up money for ourselves. And accumulate, it's the accumulating them that's the problem. That suggests having enough and yet hoarding extra for ourselves or spending extra for ourselves rather than using it for God's kingdom. And you know, putting treasure in heaven isn't just giving to the church. It's giving to the church and more. It is being there to meet the needs of the hurting and the sick and the alien and the homeless and anyone that comes into our paths, which is the, the truth that you see throughout the scripture. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world around us. We do it for his sake because we love him. Jesus says in chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, 
James, not Jesus, I'm sorry. Is it, we're going to the book of James quickly. James says in chapter 2, 14 to 16, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and eat well, but you do not give them what their body needs, what good is it? Both James and Peter consider that generosity and giving are the norm for believers. This is what's expected. Piling up money reveals that we love it more than Him. It's where our heart is. It's where our love is. And that makes it an idol. Now, not all of us have extra. And I want to make this clear, not all of us do. I grew up in a home where we, we had enough, but very little to spare. And yet, my mother hoarded her clothes that were very out of style and that she had not worn for years. It's possible to accumulate treasures even without a lot of extra. So piling up stuff is the first symptom of materialistic heart disease. And to assess, to assess our hearts, we need to determine where is our pile? Where is our pile? Is it on earth or is it in heaven? So let's read on in verses 22 to 24 to see the second sim symptom. The eye is the lamp of the body. If then your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is diseased, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. As he often did, Jesus provided a visual metaphor for his point here. The eye which opens up the, the light on the outside to the inside. The Greek adjective here that he uses to, to call the eye either good or healthy is defined as single, simple, without complexity of character and motive. It's a good eye. It's, a, it's an eye that works well, but it's also about our character. It is about a simplicity of character. It's about a good motive in our heart. And they would have understood it in that day when it was used in connection with money to often mean generous, a generous eye, a generous heart. Jesus contrasted it with a second eye, and the Greek adjective here has two meanings, a physical description, meaning diseased or blind, and an, and an ethical description, meaning evil. Jesus' audience would have immediately understood both connotations here and taken that in. They were familiar with the idea of an evil eye. The contrast here is between light and good and darkness and evil. The eye and our motives and our heart. Again, that whole, he's saying there's not a wholeness in an evil eye. Jesus goes on to say it's impossible to serve money and possessions and serve God at the same time. We can have money and possessions and serve God, but we can't serve both. What we serve is our God, is our idol, just as what we love is. So that's symptom two, being a slave to our stuff. And why do I say it's being a slave? That's because the Greek word for master in verse 24 means the owner, the one who has control. Who controls you? If somebody controls you, you are a slave to that thing. So either mammon or God controls us. And I see that. The more we see, the more we want. The more we have, the more we must spend to keep up the things that we have. The more we have to work, to get the money to buy the things that we want and to pile it up. We're enslaved to our work, to our money, to our things. Over the past year, we've done some work around our house. Much of it was just because our house is aging and we needed to replace windows. We needed some painting done. We needed some things done in the yard. But not everything we did was totally necessary. Out in our backyard, we had a problem Every winter, the grass would totally die. We would have mud and dirt all winter long. And with two dogs, all we had was mud and dirt in the house, needing to be mopped every day. And of course, that did not happen. 
Um, I did not mop every day, but we needed to do something about it. Every spring we were having to replace the entire backyard with sod. It was the only way to get the grass to grow with two dogs was to sod it in. And it was expensive to do it year after year after year. And so we faced two choices. We could cut down the trees in the backyard because a lot of it was it wasn't getting enough sun. Even in the summer, it wasn't growing extensively and well. It wasn't a lush yard. Or we could put some turf in. And you know, honestly, I really wrestled with this. I, I, for several years, Gary had wanted to do it and I just did not feel good about it. Were we being good stewards of God's money to do this? Or are we just slaves of our stuff? Um, you know, as rich people in comparison to 90% of the world, I think we always have to think of these things when we spend money on our stuff. Is this, is this really us just feeding ourselves or not? We went ahead with the work, uh, but we also upped our donations to Christian groups and organizations that meet some of the needs of some of the people we've talked about. Um, and it's just a hard question to answer sometimes. Are we serving God or our stuff? One of the two is our master. When we look at the evidence of where our money is, what we spend it on, the things that we have, how much we've accumulated, the evidence may show us that we have a symptom of materialistic heart disease. So, so far we've had two questions that help us determine if we have it. Where's the pile and whom do we serve? The final symptom that Jesus discusses is anxiety over our, over our needs. And he begins the next point in verse 25 with the word therefore. And therefore is a word of conclusion and it's always important to notice when there's a therefore, because it's building on what he's just said. He's building on the fact that he just said, put your money in heaven, not on earth. It's that he's just said you can't serve God and mammon. So let's look at it beginning in verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will drink or eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't there more to life than food and more to the body than clothing? Look at the birds in the sky. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable than they are? And which of you by worrying can add even one hour to his life? Why do you worry about clothing? Think about how the flowers of the field grow. They do not work or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory was clothed like one of these. And if this is how God clothes the wild grass, which is here today and gone tomorrow, is tossed into the fire to heat the oven, won't he clothe you even more, you people of little faith? So then don't worry saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the unconverted pursue these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But above all, pursue his kingdom and righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. So then do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. So back to the therefore. Jesus has said not to hoard money and stuff, but to use it for God's purposes. But you know, if we don't pile it up, if we aren't serving it, we may start to worry about it. That's one of the symptoms of knowing that we're concerned about our money. So, three times he says not to worry. Verse 25, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Verse 31, so then don't worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the unconverted pursue these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And in verse 34, which begins with another concluding term, so then do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. The third symptom helps us identify what we're relying on. Are we relying on our stuff and our money to give us our needs, or are we relying on God? If we trust our money and savings, even when we have it, we often worry, will I be able to keep it? Is it enough? We get anxious. If we rely on God, we should not be anxious because we know what he has just told us, that he knows our needs. He is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows our needs. 
and he is he is omnipotent, which means he is all powerful. He is able to meet our needs. It doesn't mean we don't act to provide for ourselves. Yes, we are to work, we are to do what we can, but we're not to be anxious about the result. Note the promise in verse 33. Above all, pursue his kingdom and righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. There is an if here. There is a contingency here. God doesn't promise to meet everyone's needs. He promises to meet the needs of those who aren't depending on their idols of money and stuff. He promises to meet the needs of those who are seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. So if you like me, and this is a major problem with me, and this passage is hard, I worry about security. I look ahead, and we're both semi-retired. I look ahead and say, do we have what we need to live the rest of our lives? And so I have a hard time letting go of it. But these rever verses remind me I don't need to be anxious because God knows and God is there and he will care for us. There is no security in that wealth and that stuff. There is none, we think there is and there is not. The only security is truly in God. And if we are seeking first his, his kingdom over all else, we will generously give. We will not hang on to our stuff because it was never given us just for us. It was always given that we would share freely with those who need it, that we would be the merciful people of the Beatitudes, that our, our eyes are on His righteousness, not our stuff. You know, when I've been on mission trips, I've served women who are much poorer than the average American, much poorer than, than I am, for sure. And I've seen a loveliness of spirit, spirit and a depth of faith in them that I rarely see here. And I certainly don't feel like I have it, and I've envied them for it. And one of the reasons I think they have it is because they can't rely on their stuff or themselves. They have nothing. They rely totally on God, and it is, it is built a beauty into them that I certainly know that I do not have. Um, I think it's part of what blessed or the poor involves. There is a blessing um, because you rely on God. So if we do a self-examination for materialistic heart disease, we look at our stuff, where we've piled it, who we serve with it, and whether we worry about it. And I have all kinds of excuses for investing in self instead of God's kingdom, seeing my stuff control me, and relying on my funds to take care of me. So how do we get rid of that idol of money from our hearts? What's the antidote so that we love, serve, and worry, and we no longer love, sorry, serve, and worry over our money and stuff? Let's look back at the commands of ni verses 19 to 21 and don't know do. Do not accumulate for yourselves treasures on earth, but accumulate for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The first part of the cure is really just to quit accumulating this stuff and begin giving and, and prioritizing God's kingdom. And I thought about the, the story of the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, 16 to 22. It really aligns with everything Jesus says here. He says the same thing to the rich young ruler that he says to us. Now someone came up to him and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to gain eternal life? He said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he asked. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I've wholeheartedly obeyed all these laws. What do I lack still? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. The same phrase, treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he was very rich. 
Jesus knew this man worshiped the idol of money. He was not loving his neighbors in, for, as himself by keeping his money. And to remove the idol, the cure required that he give it away. It was the only way for him to get rid of the idol that he had. But he loved his money and his possessions and he ignored the treasures of heaven. Uh, the cure here reminds me also of some words earlier in this sermon where Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. It's that important to completely destroy our idols. When we have an idol, it must be destroyed. In the Old Testament, they had to burn them to get rid of them completely. After we do that, the second part of the cure for materialistic heart disease is in verse 33. But above all, pursue his kingdom and righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. We must replace the idol with a greater love or we will go back to doing the same thing. We must replace it with a greater love, a greater love for God. It's a love for God that causes us to invest in God's kingdom. That's where our heart will be when we put our money there. If we seek his kingdom first, we won't pile up money here. We will give it to him. We won't be slaves to our stuff, but we'll be a slave to God. And we won't worry about our security, but rely on God. In this day of the already but not yet stage of the kingdom, we are here to share the gospels and share with others in ways that show God's character to the world and give them a glimpse of what God's kingdom will be like. It's being salt and light in a dying world. But practically, and this is, this is where it gets hard, practically how do we really do this in a, in a materialistic culture, in our wealthy culture, how do we do this? And the best answer I can come up with is simplicity. Simplicity is a spiritual discipline that has been practiced for centuries. Uh, base, it's been based on scriptures such as the one we just read, scriptures such as the one about the, the rich young ruler, scriptures such as where Paul says that he has learned to be content with little. Adele Calhoun defines the desire behind simplicity. He said, she says, the desire is to uncomplicate and untangle my life so I can focus on what really matters. It's more than just a monetary view on life. It is a view of life that looks at what you need versus what your wants are, that looks at what you really need for your life and how to spend it. It's not asceticism where you renounce all of your worldly goods. Jesus didn't do that. We aren't called to do that. Simplicity delights in God's gifts. Delight in the fact that you have a home. Delight in the fact that you can be with your family. But it involves putting God's kingdom first in every area of life. Your time, your money, your style of living, your activities. I mean, how many activities do your kids really need to be in? There's a simplicity of living that goes along with the simplicity of money and possessions. Calhoun says this about the benefits. Simplicity creates margins and spaces and openness in our lives. It honors the resources of our small planet. It offers us the leisure of tasting the present moment. Simplicity asks us to let go of the tangle of wants so we can receive the simple gifts of life that cannot be taken away. Sleeping, eating, walking, giving, and receiving love. The benefits we take for granted are amazing gifts. Simplicity is it invites us into these daily pleasures that can open us to God who is present in them all. I read about a church in the late 40s whose pastor named Gordon encouraged its members to give away far more than they kept. And a member wrote this. She said, Gordon said as forcefully as ever that to give away money is to win a victory over the dark powers that oppress us. He talked about reclaiming for ourselves the energy with which we have endowed money. And I thought about this. There is dark powers behind idolatry and sin, and they get a hold of us through our money and our stuff. If we want to defeat that bondage, that slavery that it has over us, we have to take action by giving it away. 
The principle of simplicity helps me find a clearer way forward, however. Getting rid of my excesses and not replacing them, living simply and more generously, giving every time God puts a need in front of me that, that touches my heart, whether it's making food for my neighbor with cancer or giving donations uh, to Christian organizations that are helping those people that need it out there, or giving away more than I spend on myself, or when I spend for myself, giving money away. And I've learned the last few years, when I start worrying about my security, I give. I, I find a place to give extra money to immediately because I'm, I'm putting faith in money again instead of in God. And I don't worry about it as much as I did. The lure of money can lead us to materialistic heart disease. Its symptoms are piling it up for ourselves, being enslaved to it, and being anxious about it. And that helps us diagnose the root problem. The cure is extreme for some of us. Only God can tell us how much we need to change. He, in the rich young ruler's case, it was, you've got to give it all up. It's that bad. Your, your illness is this bad. Um, so none of us can look at another person and say, this is what you should do. But it, that's the only way to break the power of money and things in our lives. We've got to stop piling it up on earth and giving it away and seek after God's kingdom and His righteousness with our whole hearts. That's where our love must be. It's doable if we trust the one who knows our needs and the one who has the power to meet them. Let's pray. Father, these are hard principles in a land where we, we have so much. And yet I pray that you'll just continue changing me that I might live this out more and more in my life. And I pray for all of those who watch this. I pray the same. In Jesus' name, amen.